So hear me out. Intel isn't exactly having the best time right now. I mean, sure, they make some fantastic laptop CPUs, but when it specifically comes to the desktop gaming side of things, things just aren't as rosy as they used to be. Remember the days when AMD was almost a joke option, and Intel Core i5 and i7 was dominant, and a top-spec gaming GPU was just £420? Ah oh, yes, the good old days. And as I say, things have changed, which is why today I wanted to go through and answer one simple question. Is Intel cooked? <laughs> Such a stupid phrase. In order for all of this to properly make sense, we first have to go back, conveniently, to my first ever PC build, and probably the greatest gaming CPU of all time, the Intel Core i5-2500K. This 4-core CPU was an absolute unit and brought maximum gaming performance to the masses. Sure, there was an i7, but gamers didn't really need hyper-threading, so as you would today, that extra would go towards a better graphics card. Intel had well and truly innovated, and had created something that would properly stand the test of time. In fact, this was a chip that didn't need upgrading for years. You see, back then, games just weren't really that CPU bound, and rarely used more than one or two cores. And because they weren't the power-hungry beast that we have today, overclocking your processor was relatively easy, and gave real performance boost whenever they were required. As they always seemed to, the next few years flew by, and generally speaking, nothing really changed. Intel were releasing new chips, they still had the best single-core performance, but they were still only four cores, and the innovation was starting to get a little bit stale. It took a whole five generations before people really started to notice, and definitely for me it was KB Lake and the i5-7600 that I would say was a real low point. It was a rehashed four-core effort, but was still the best choice for gaming. Why was there no real competition? Until suddenly, there was! Enter Ryzen and the 1800X, a massive CPU that doubled the core count to a whopping 8 CPU cores. The only problem? It wasn't the best at gaming. I mean, don't get me wrong, it still was a fantastic option, especially if you were playing at 4K, but you'd probably clap nicely at the innovation, but then silently pick up Intel still at the till. But make no mistake, this was the start of something, a resistance to the status quo and a surefire effort to overthrow the champs. Two years later, and it happened again! Intel had only just started increasing their core counts to 8, but AMD raised the stakes to 16, and were getting seriously close to Intel with their single-threaded performance. Not to mention the fact that any of these chips were still compatible with the original AMD B150 motherboards, assuming you'd done a BIOS update. And at this point, things really had started to turn for Intel. I mean, I'd say that the last great CPU that they had was the 10900K, which increased the core count to 10, but then they superseded this with this, which was an 8-core CPU that did have better gaming performance, but the way they'd managed to do that was to actually drop down the core count from 10 to 8. To say things were going backwards would be a bit of an understatement. From this point onwards, killer blows came from all angles. Intel switched up their CPUs to include efficient cores and performance cores, which was great for productivity and laptops, but arguably unnecessary for gaming, whilst AMD doubled down and launched their 5800X3D chip the first AMD CPU to actually beat Intel in gaming performance against all but the most extreme Intel CPU. Things then went from bad to worse with 13th gen, as whilst the launch performance was actually pretty darn good, stories of dying CPUs started to mount up, AMD launched a whole new AM5 platform, and then the final nail in the coffin, the Ryzen 7 7800X3D. And this CPU is still in my PC today, hence the empty box, and it really did mark the point where AMD did become the best CPU for gaming. And I mean, sure, Ryzen 9000 didn't exactly move the needle much to improve things, but at least they didn't go backwards. And this, of course, brings us to present day, where Intel Core Ultra was, and still arguably is, a disaster. Worse gaming performance than the previous generation chips, yet having better power efficiency, but still using more watts than the 7800X3D. Now, to Intel's credit, they have spent loads of time fixing the performance with updates and new modes. Heck, even decreasing the price to honestly minuscule amounts during the recent Prime Day sales. But the fact remains, if you want the best gaming performance today, you buy AMD. And honestly, this is a real shame because the whole reason that we have a CPU as good as the 78 and 9800X3D in the first place is through great competition between AMD and Intel. And it's a massive shame that on the channel, this is the first Core Ultra build that I've done in a long, long time. And when I did it, I came away disappointed. It's so good for everyone to 
to have competition because you get better performance and lower prices. If you have a look at the most recent AMD 9000 series launch, you'll notice that those CPUs were starting to creep up a little bit. They were still okay, but if domination continues, there's no reason why they couldn't just increase the prices because people will buy AMD anyway, if they are the best. But I don't want this to be a big video all about doom and gloom. I want this to look into the future a little bit and see if there is actually in anything that Intel is and can do to fix this issue and once again have the two teams battling it out and be very, very neck and neck. So let's roll up our sleeves and discuss everything that you need to know right after a short word from this video's sponsor. Corsair's epic triple chamber case has arrived, bringing next level cooling and stunning panoramic looks. The Corsair Air 5400 utilizes a standalone chamber that's dedicated for all-in-one liquid coolers, cleverly diverting the hot air away from your motherboard, graphics cards and SSDs. The main chamber oozes luxury, with its curved tempered glass highlighting all of your prized components and providing a flow-through design to keep your graphics card cool and quiet, with airflow ducts designed to feed air to where it's needed the most. The Air 5400 also features the Rapid Route 2.0 cable management system in the third chamber, letting you easily create a tidy build, and thanks to the new brush cable Cable grommets, it's now simpler than ever. It comes fitted with either reverse blade RS fans for simplicity or LXR fans for IQ Link luxury, and it's available in either black or white. Learn more and level up today with the link down below. Welcome back and let us resume our talk about Intel's future because I've been discussing this very topic with Intel over the last few days and their new answer lies in their just announced Panther Lake 18A 2 nanometer architecture. Now these processors represent the foundation for what's to come and admittedly I was pretty impressed with almost everything that I heard. Now Panther Lake is a mobile architecture that ups the core count significantly on thin and light machines going from 8 cores to 16, uses the next generation of XE graphics, and yes, this is the stuff that will be coming to the proper desktop Arc Generation 3 GPUs. Exciting stuff. I say well, it's speculation, but let's be honest, it almost certainly will. And all this comes together to enable a mobile device with up to 128 gigabytes of DDR5 memory, 10% faster single core and 50% faster multi-core performance, as well as that whopping integrated GPU with 50% more performance than Lunar Lake. And I've got to admit that the tech bro inside me gets very excited about the prospect of like a really thin laptop that actually has loads of gaming performance that you can play on battery on the train, not need like a battery bank. Oh, and it'd be phenomenal. But obviously that's a little bit outside the realm of what we're talking about today. The reason it's important is because it kind of is almost like the direction that they're heading in. And it's just great to see that Intel really are starting to innovate again. My take is that if they can make a laptop chip that's 10% faster whilst reducing the process size, we could see smaller e-cores with more performant p-cores. If they're tuned for power, you might be able to squeeze even more out of it with more power. And if they can actually power the transistors from the underside of the wafer, maybe they can add a stack more cash to the performance cores while they're at it. And obviously everything at the moment is very much up in the air. But what I can tell you was that this was a very, very useful event, not just to learn about what's coming up from Panther Lake and obviously the new process and all of this stuff, but also just kind of talking to some of the PR people and just kind of grilling them and asking them not only about Core Ultra, but about what's coming next. And I'm really pleased actually with the conversations that were had because it seemed to me that they were very, very open to hold up their hands and say, look, we know Core Ultra wasn't really what kind of we wanted it to be. We're aware of the mistakes we're going to fix them next time. And this is also compounded by the fact that I had some conversations a while ago with like a OEM or like PCs essentially. And they kind of told me that Core Ultra from their impression anyway, changed at the last, well not the last minute, but relatively late into the production cycle. It was going to be something else and then it became something else. So everyone was kind of a little bit out of alignment. So for the next generation, I'm not talking about the refreshed Ultra, the proper next generation, generation of Intel desktop gaming CPUs, they obviously need to do a few things to get back on top. The first one really is just to have the best gaming performance. If they got very close and they traded blows, you know, that's be frustrating, but it would be fine from like a business point of view, but they really do need to have the best gaming performance. And if this means having their own version of AMD's 3D vCache, then do that. You've had plenty of time to develop something. You can say, oh, it's not, not necessary or whatever you've been saying for the last few years. Well, I would find it very, very odd if they didn't have an equivalent that boosted the performance in the same way. Second thing you need to do is obviously have a socket that's going to last because like it or not, and from a consumer's point of view, we love it. We want to buy a motherboard and have it last three, four, five, maybe even six years before we get a new one. Like even if it's like you're trying to save money, you could buy like used CPUs, but just different generations of CPUs with a BIOS update is really useful. And that's what games expect now. And all the time AMD are doing this, you can't compare 
compete on gaming performance because you don't have that anymore. So you've got to open up your platform. By all means, bring out new features every year or whatever it is to keep the motherboard manufacturers happy, but keep the socket the same so gamers can just enjoy PC gaming for longer, essentially. And then the third thing, I think this is going to be a whole lot harder, and this is all about regaining trust because people were using Intel for years, myself included, and that was like the de facto upgrade, right? And what we're seeing in the GPU space at the moment is that people go for NVIDIA. I mean, 70% of people just go for NVIDIA and they don't consider anything else. That may well change in the future if NVIDIA make Intel's prime mistakes, which is to seize innovating. But especially with what happened with 13th and 14th gen, and then you think you've got a load of massive Intel fans that have gone out and bought 450, 500 pound motherboards and a Core Ultra 9. And then if there's no other CPU they can upgrade to and the CPU wasn't like the best straight out of the gate, I think that's going to leave a little bit of a bad taste in the mouth, really. So you've got a lot of work to do to kind of regain gamers' trusts back. But ultimately, the main thing really is just to sort the socket out and just ensure that you have the best gaming performance. And hopefully, as long as you have the reliability and you look after gamers, the trust will just come naturally along with that, essentially. I'm going to add, though, that time is running out. You see how most pre-builds currently use Intel? Well, that's down to the years, if not decades, of gaming leadership. And the longer Ryzen is the top of the charts and top of gamers' minds, the stronger the odds of seeing Team Red dominate where it really profits, the OEM market. There are arguably some external factors in Intel's favor, though. Namely, Intel Foundry's USA-based production lines and AMD's lack thereof. It's still a new market for all the players, but Intel having a hand in both design and production could prove useful if things get a little bit more choppy internationally. Remember, Intel Foundry is currently producing 2 nanometers today in both Oregon and Arizona. But don't forget, of course, that AMD hopefully aren't going to sit still and absolutely are going to put up a fight. Are they going to be the next generation rocket ship or is it going to be a rocket lake? That's a proper CPU joke there. Rocket Lake was the code name for the 11900K that took away two cores. Intel also launched their own version of multi-frame generation last week, and this is actually very exciting. Not because MFG is the best thing since your mum last cooked your dinner, but because they are actually releasing a version of Presentmon alongside it that shows you the actual rendered frame rate of your game when the tech is enabled, and vow to show you this whenever they quote FPS numbers in graphs. No more fake frames, though we'll see how long this sticks, shall we? I'm pleased to say that I got to see the tech working, and to the naked eye, it works as well as I've seen from NVIDIA, which is very smooth, but as expected, carries more impact lag whenever the technology is enabled. So overall, I'd say the word is optimistic. I'm optimistic about Intel's future. They've just obviously had that massive investment from NVIDIA. Uh, they've got a new CEO, and I think a lot of their plans have been a bit of a slow burn, where they've kind of hampered their own performance and just put themselves in a bit of a mess. I don't want to say deliberately, but almost on their roadmap, and that the rewards will come at a later date. That's what I want to see happen, but it is a weird thing, isn't it, to kind of be doing so well in the mobile segment, and as I say, innovating massively, and Panther Lake I think is incredibly exciting. But then on the desktop side, you've almost tried to apply some of that, and it's just not really worked. So I think the most interesting thing for me is with the next generation of Core Ultra, or whatever they decide to call it if they change the name, is are they gonna kind of double down on this and just optimize it and make it even better to the point where suddenly it makes a whole bunch of sense? Or are they gonna not necessarily go back to the drawing board, but kind of stick to what AMD is doing, which is just to have like the best desktop cores essentially, and then have the best gaming performance that way with some added VCAM. It's very, very difficult to say, but the question goes out to you on this one. I mean, how many of you guys have picked up Core Ultra, especially recently in the sales where, honestly, I think I saw an Ultra 5 for under £150 or something in the UK? Don't quote me on that, but it was very, very cheap, very impressive. Same with the like, Ultra 7 as well, but that's not the point of this. Have you picked one of those up? Have you been happy with it? And ultimately, what do you think about Intel and AMD and the race and the competition between the two of them? Are you buying a gaming PC? Which way would you go? Let us know down in the comment section below, but a massive thank you to everyone for watching this video. It's really appreciated. Smash the like button if you've enjoyed it. Get yourself subscribed, and we'll catch you in the next one. Parts list related to this are located down below because it's very pretty.